Welcome everyone. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming uh, this evening along to our second in a series of um, public programmes accompanying our Nova X exhibition in the Lethbridge Gallery here at Central St Martins in King's Cross. Um, on top of the physical exhibition in the Lethbridge Gallery, we also have a full um, digital exhibition online with an amazing website that has been created uh, for this show. Um, the physical exhibition is on until um, the 23rd of October and the website um, is on for longer so if you don't get the chance to see the physical show do check out the website um, and it's got it's amazing actually um, and I can say that because I didn't make it. Um, I'm Sarah Hardy um, I'm a creative producer here at Central St Martins um, for performance, galleries and um, uh, public programmes. And um, when I'm not doing that, I am an artist um, and curator as well. Um, this, um, this whole series of events and the exhibition um, is, done, uh, is enabled through a partnership with Mullen Low Group, um, who are, the, and the, the reason this is happening is a celebration of 10 years of the partnership, um, whereby NOVA awards are given at the end of every year um, to, to the most outstanding students and innovative students. Um, and so we've had this long, amazing, fruitful partnership with them and the exhibition celebrates that downstairs. Um, so um, from, yeah, from 1,300 graduating students, just six Mullen Low Nova Award uh, winners are chosen. So we're looking at the um, really exciting collection of artists in front of us tonight. Um, so the um, Nova X, the exhibition itself, celebrates, as I say, the decade of award-winning creative practice um, and invites viewers to examine the many trajectories that artists and designers can take. Um, it tells stories of transformation, exploration, interrogation, production and tenacity that it takes to have a successful um, creative career beyond um, university. Um, and the show is sharing how past winners, um, how, they are, um, how the NOVA Awards have propelled these winners into their careers um, after university. Um, mapping their practices, stories and interconnections as constellations. Um, it was curated uh, by um, Abby Vickris and Paul Finn, who are both lecturers at Central St Martins in, and are graphic designers in their own rights. Um, and we did it via an open call for um, content um, and a huge audit of materials and like learning and knowledge that we got sent back in by all the artists. Um, and then you know decided what we wanted to do from there and how best to um, display and uh, do justice to all the amazing diverse works that um, the artists and designers have um, been making in the last between one and ten years, um, which the exhibition spans the, the graduation, if you know what I mean, like every every year someone else you know wins. So we've got the first ever winner to the most recent winner. Um, and Sandra um, is 2020's winner. And then we've got our 2021 winners actually um, in the window galleries downstairs. Um, so we worked with Studio Hype to um, do this, uh, do a sort of diagrammatic um, plotting the award winners over a constellation and a series of tagged themes to highlight the similarities, differences, and connections in their creative practices. Um, the um, uh, the, we also did commissions, which were really exciting and we're proud to be, have been able to um, further artists and designers' careers um, through, um, through these commissions again, so um, another great thing about partnership with Malmo. Um, so thank you to our sponsors um, and collaborators, Malmo Group, um, and um, kicking off tonight, uh, we've got chairing this evening, we've got Janine Francois, um, their pronouns are they, them. Um, I should have said my pronouns are she, hers. Um, Janine is a course leader for BA Culture Criticism and Curation at Central St Martins. Um, they are a black British feminist critic, writer and cultural producer who is known for their insightful, critical but piercing perspectives on race and social justice. Um, Janine's practices deconstruct whiteness and race 
within cultural and academic institutions through their writing, curating, producing, research, teaching and consultancy. Um, they set up University of the Arts London's first ever Hip Hop Cultures module and have established the Royal College of Arts first ever Hip Hop Studies reading group as a visiting lecturer. Janine is also a PhD candidate at University of Bedfordshire slash uh, in partnership with the Tate um, and they are exploring if Tate um, can be a safer space to discuss issues of race and cultural differences within a teaching and learning context. Uh, and I can highly recommend um, Janine's writing, uh, which I've read recently, um, How the UK Failed Black Britons Would Be Pop Superstars in the Independent in 2020. Um, it's an amazing article, um, so yeah, do give it, do check it out. Um, I think um, I will hand over to Janine now. Sorry, that was probably longer than uh, I should have gone on for, but I wanted to give you a full uh, context to what we're discussing tonight, um, and I'll hand over to Jean now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. It's always weird when someone reads that your bio. It's like <laughs> super, super cringe. Oh. No, it's great. But I'm going to do 23. <laughs> yeah. I'm pass on the cringe. <laughs> so I really appreciate you reading that. So yeah, I work here at St. Martin's, and I've been at UAR for about five years, working across the different colleges. So I'm really excited to be here tonight and to speak to the artists and to hear about all of your amazing practices and hopefully we can have a really nice conversation in the room. Um, feel free to ask questions, there will be a formal part at the end and just to kind of quickly walk through the structure, so we have each artist will speak about their work for about five to ten minutes and um, I will introduce them with their bio and at the end I will ask them each question and then I will hand over to the audience so please start thinking about questions, formulating questions whilst each artist is presenting. So I hope that sounds like a fair structure to everybody. I'm not the chair that holds the artist, so <laughs> I will be looking quite generously to the audience to get some engagement and participation. So I really would like to encourage uh, to have questions. Also to the artists, feel free to ask each other questions. Mm. I mean, that's also really nice um, as a way to engage and connect. So again, whilst your fellow artist is speaking, feel free to formulate questions that you would like to pose to each other as well so we can have a really nice and rich um, dialogue. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first artist, which is Sarah Paulson. And Sandra. Sandra. Sorry, I keep saying Sarah. I'm really sorry. That's Let me do that again. I'm going to introduce our first artist, <laughs> Sandra Paulson, who goes by using she, her pronouns. So Sandra is an Angolan interdisciplinary artist, researcher and fashion practitioner, living and working between London and Luanda. Sandra's practice discusses the political, cultural and social economic landscape of Angola as a case study to analyse the relationship between history, oral traditions and global political structures. Focus on their own local Rwandan experience and history to investigate networks between micro-political moments and how they reverberate into macro politics. Sandra graduated from BA Fashion Print at Central St. Martin's in 2020 and won the Mono Loa Nova Award in 2020 your Nova Award, the Central St. Martin's Dean's Collection Award as well. Sandra was selected for the Bloomberg New Contemporaries in 2021 and was shortlisted for the Mason Zero Green Trail Award in 2020. Since graduating, Sandra's work was shown with Bode Bode Lounge at the Salt Basel and the Guggenheim Museum in New York, in the Bujo Art Week, Art Joe Berg at the Madrid 21 as an opening prize. Amongst other things, Sandra has some upcoming shows in this Bezel in 2020, the South London Gallery and others. And you can catch Sandra on sandrapolson.com or via Instagram or Twitter or at Sandra Paulson. So without further ado, I'm going <laughs> to hand over to you and I hope you can introduce us to your work. Yes, thank you. That was draining. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is who you are. <laughs> and hence the cringe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn, for the introduction. I have to update that because it's too long. Well, I, I might just uh, stand up. Um, so, you know, Sarah doesn't really know this, but today we were, so we were invited to speak about one object. Uh, I'm known for being really off brief. So I also selected two things, and I was like, how do I cram this into 10 minutes? But uh, essentially, I think uh, the first object as um, Form of contextualizing the object that I actually I'm actually bringing tonight. 
So the first object is this t-shirt, uh, which has been, you know, core in my practice, in my final year, doing, you know, working on an Angolan archive, my graduation project, for my dissertation, the white president t-shirt, uh, propaganda and semiotics in post-colonial Angola, and has continued to be something that is existing with me. This t-shirt is something that is worn by farmers in northern Angola, in Cabinda. Um, and, you know, when I first come across this image, which usually I would work with photographs that I take instead of photographs that I find, uh, but this is something that I really had to uh, just sort of understand why is a farmer in the northern region of Angola, of Cabinda, wearing this t-shirt with the huge EU uh, flag on it. Um, and that's, you know, this, this name, the EU Polo shirt, is actually the name that I gave it, uh, so I could continue engaging with it in an easy way within my work. But just asking questions and, you know, wh why is this really happening? So I found out that the EU has um, basically started this funding program in that region. Um, today I was actually doing the calculations for how much exact money in pounds the EU have put into this project. Uh, I forgot the number and I was like, you don't want to be like too, you know, this amount and this, but it goes up to like cents. Um, and it's something around 400,000 pounds. Uh, it's, it's a really quite fairly small amount of money. Uh, and, and, you know, as a, as, a, as a fashion graduate, I would even try to guess how much just the production of so many t-shirts might have gone into, particularly these white t-shirts, but we're not even getting there right now. Um, what, what I think is interesting about this object is this, it seems to me that it's pretty much out of context. And, and so it's quite important to start thinking about why this object is in this location. So this is a little extract from my dissertation, which, you know, really I'm analyzing objects that are outside of their context, exist in Angola, are almost like naturalized objects that come from the outside and become more familiar to people in the, in the region than to people outside the region. And so this is, I see that it's really blurry, but this is a, this is you know, pretty much one of the, 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 the ways of, 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 I guess, relating and discussing and questioning uh, things that I found and also images that I, I sort of produced and films that I produced, uh, which is this kind of responsive writing medium that is one of my mediums. It's basically me jumping from English to Portuguese and a really terrible um, English, Spanish, Portuguese something, uh, but responding and kind of dropping the references that I have from lived experience versus historical references. So I'll take you guys to why, why this t-shirt is actually there. This is Cabinda. This is my favorite slide today. Um, this is Cabinda in red, just at the very top there. So as you see, Cabinda is actually not touching the main, re so the main, um, yeah, the main uh, border of Angola that, that separates the country from the, the, the DRC, Zambia, Namibia, Botswana, kind of. Uh, Kabinda is, is this kind of little enclave that is just out there. It's not touching. I'll just come to this side so I can actually see it as well. Um, so essentially, in the um, Congo Conference in 1884, 1885, um, there was this, I guess, big Congo conference held in Berlin. There was this big, uh, you know, fight, I guess, between the Belgium and the Portuguese. At the time, Angola was uh, Portuguese territory, and the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, was a Belgian territory. I don't know if you guys can see, but there's a little sliver that goes from the Atlantic, and then that whole region is the DR DRC, and then the DRC expands. And then up there, you have the Republic of Congo. So that was the French part. That was Belgium, that was Portugal. Um, and so they are essentially fighting over the entrance of the Congo River, which is that dotted red line that I put up there. Cabinda is just there. Essentially, Belgium won this fight over the entrance of this river because this river was leading up to the Democratic Republic of Congo, well, actually, it was, it was started in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it was an essential highway for the transport of trafficked enslaved people. So this is a very big currency for this region, and, and, and Belgium won that fight. In compensation, it's decided that the region of Cabinda, which at the time belonged to Belgium, was going to be granted to Portugal uh, as a, I'm sorry, sort of gift. <laughs> Uh, and so this is why Cabinda, the Angolan territory, doesn't touch Angola physically, and it's this little island, you know, between those two other countries. 
The thing is, in the 20th century, uh, Cabin is discovered to be one of the main um, oil reservoirs of the region. Uh, around 2008, Cabinda was able to produce around 1.9 million barrels of uh, oil per day. Nigeria produced 2.1. So we're talking 1.9 to 2.1. Nigeria all together, which is like oil. And Cabinda alone was producing 1.9. So what I'm basically saying is now you guys know why the EU was there. Uh -huh. you know, we can move on. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I'm quite interested essentially about uh, you know, actually finding these objects, finding these things, but then based on things that I read, that I found, that I hear from my parents, from my grandparents, you know, stories of stories, which is really what Angolan history is, is stories of stories. Um, just trying to understand why certain things are happening in a certain way, why would these, you know, huge merchandise, I didn't bring you the, the worst images, which are essentially uh, little flags, little stickers of the EU flag that are stuck on everything the EU has funded, from water wells to like water containers, pretty much buckets. And it's like, we helped, you know, 75% of the funding towards this. And it's like, that's okay, you know, it's great to have this micro project. The important thing is that region actually is responsible for 89% of Angola's, um, and I don't know how to say this word in English, PIP? The G GDP. GDP. Yeah. The GDP, exactly. So it's, thank you, it's, it's responsible for 89% of Angola's GDP. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's pretty clear that this is a core region um, and it's a core resource as well. So, fast forward into how then I come across this other image. Uh, you know, this image, this is Princess Diana Charan, uh, 1997, Central Angola, Wambu. Uh, when searching in this platform that we don't know which one it is, which is pretty much the biggest, um, you know, organization in the world for image writing, um, and, uh, and how do I say licensing in the world? Um, when, when, when searching Angola as the sort of Angola hashtag and the most popular images, Charan, I remember a while ago, like two years ago, when I used to research this, this one wasn't the first image and then it changed. It was the first, the second, the third, the fourth. I don't know what really happened here, but it used to be like the first 10 images used to be this very same image because there was different photographers in, this, in the place. So what I found out is that this photograph is the most licensed, paid for, used uh, image in regards to Angola, when Angola is mentioned in the international press, books, publications, documentaries in the last 24 years. Diana has died months after this visit. Um, and, and, and this is very much still um, the, the photograph that sort of runs the idea of Angola, which is very much the idea of the Angolan War, um, and, and, and sort of that communicates mm -hmm. the country, the region, in a way. Um, so I sort of, so yeah, big image. Um, so I sort of um, actually had the opportunity of licensing this image once for a publication for a magazine, like this Canadian, uh, really interesting magazine called New Currency. Uh, this, you know, loads of young people from Toronto and Lagos connecting and, and, and they invited me to show parts of my final project and we are able to together license this image. Uh, that's why I, can't, I have the actual image here. And then, really, during my final project, I was quite interested um, in, again, going back to the object. This is, this is the actual object of the evening. So going back to the object, I, I wasn't able to, to access the actual object. Object is, is incredibly difficult. And I have never been in Wambo, which is something I don't want to be misleading on. Um, but, but I sort of recreated the object based on what I could see. This is a version that is a bit si more similar to what Princess, Prince Harry wore a uh, couple of years ago when he was in almost the same place. Um, and, and sort of start thinking about the meaning of the object, not necessarily in a sort of a global media perspective, but locally. What does it mean, you know, what, okay, what does it mean uh, to, 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 to actually be in contact with this? So this waistcoat is uh, the equipment used by people removing landmines uh, in central Angola and in really across the country and across the globe. Uh, it prevents someone from dying, it doesn't prevent someone from losing limbs. Um, and um, it usually is blue and it has the, the, the logo of the Halo Trust, it has the flag of the country that is being demanded, it has the flag of the country that is uh, contributing towards sponsoring, I don't know if you can see, but just there in Prince Harris, just there's a, there's, a, there's a flag of the United Kingdom, maybe I'm wrong, of England, 
Uh, United States Kingdom. Yeah. You know, I can see. Oh, I, I've got hands. I can't actually see. It's so small. Uh, the, the British flag, oh, okay. I think. Yeah. Thank you. That's no, all right. For sharing the out. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so I, mean, I started really thinking about this project and the context, and what then sort of continues happening is I start thinking about what happens when the object is removed from um, the references that allow us to recognize it. So when it's removed from this color that tells us this is probably that waistcoat and it's not a life jacket, what happens when the logo is removed and we have a white space where anything can happen with actually any corporation or a lot of corporations, not any, a lot of corporations from the West could be could have their logo there, so the space stays open, uh, pretty much to be occupied by imagination. Um, but also, what happens with object when it's removed from the core space where we are familiar with seeing it? Which no, it's not the land, land uh, no, it's not the minefields, minefields in Angola. It's the body of Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. This is the space where we can relate with the Halo Trust waistcoat. This is the space where we recognize it from. And yes, that image is an image that maybe not necessarily you know most people in their 20s but most people in their 30s onwards will recognize that image even if vaguely sometimes with a description so this is actually a, a, a an installation view from the sort of the the latest iteration that i, I did of this waistcoat uh when sort of removing it from context and and almost making it unrecognizable this was shown about two weeks ago at least the uh, Art Fair in Basel, um, and I'll show you some details. And it sort of brings the, I guess, through the materials, through the color, um, it, it sort of rediscusses the meaning of the object in, in regards to the soci societal memory of uh, a local person from the, 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 the starting point of a local person. So the color being used is the color that we're super familiar with, which is the color of the palm oil, the sunset, the ground, uh, the color of the explosion, really. I have to finish now. Um, and, 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 this, and this fabric really is bringing this idea of the memorabilia, this fabric that should probably be, would probably be in a palace, that is something that sort of comes back and then goes back to the object, because obviously this object doesn't exist in the household, as most of the things that I analyze in my work, uh, but, but does kind of leave brand free in the mind. I, w I want to continue. Thank you so much. And I wish I could say more. <laughs> I'm so sorry to cut you. No, no, that's OK. But could we give Sandra a minute? Yeah. Thank you for setting that really rich context. I think it really sets a really nice kind of provocation. So now I'm going to introduce Maria. Uh, Maria Gasparian, uh, pronouns are she and her. So Maria was trained as an architect and holds an MA in ceramic design from Central St. Martins. In 2016, she founded the Maria Gasparian Studio, a practice that combines architecture, art, and design as a consultancy practice, with a particular focus on the integration of ceramics in buildings and public spaces. She was awarded a Winston Churchill Travelling Fellowship for a 2016 research for the application for architectural ceramics in America and Europe. In 2017, Maria won the Future Lights and Ceramics European Competition Award, going to exhibit her work across Europe. She was a winner of the London Festival of Architecture for City Beverages Competition in 2018. The project was shortlisted for the Brick Awards in 2018 too. Maria is now a doctoral research student at Central St. Martin, and her practice-based PhD focused on the design of craft making, manufacture, and architectural ceramics, aiming to contribute to the design of, can, can say this word, Convivial, is that right? Convivial. Convivial, thank you, <laughs> Urban Research. And you can find more about Maria on her website at mariagasparian.com. So I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's my time to criticize. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I've been told to bring an object. I actually mm -hmm. brought two. It's been a bit naughty, <laughs> but they are very much interlinked. So I'll okay. show those for you. Right. And here. I also have an image. Right. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as Janine said, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, and my media of my practice is clay. Um, and fired clay is called ceramics, as everybody knows. So my first object is a little bowl, <laughs> and I will say what this means to me, uh, how it inspired my work. Um, apart from being an artist, I'm also an architect. And that allows me to work across scales, from micro scale to macro scale. And I can't help it. I always think, what, how can I put things in, in buildings? 
Um, so it's actually been quite, um, quite an honor, quite, quite a privilege of having understanding of both scales. Um, being able to make things by hand, and that's what this ball is. Um, if any of you have made ever ceramics, you would know how amazing uh, working with clay is. It's very physical. Um, it's also amazing material because it transforms. Um, you start with a malleable, very malleable, very soft material that you can form on a wheel. This one particularly was thrown on a wheel. Um, but then magic happens when you put it into a kiln. Um, it becomes snow-like. And amazing thing for me as an architect that it's very, very long-lasting. It's a dream of material for architects because once it's fired, um, it's basically the most long-lasting material ever made by, by people. And we've seen it for millennia, for centuries. Every culture around the world has ceramic objects. Um, and it actually carries with itself cultural references. It carries the language of the space, of a place. And being in architecture, it obviously reflects all of this amazing heritage of a material. So my work is very much about materiality. It's about clay, but it's also about what, what, what can be done with it. Um, so having made this ball and fired it, I've decorated it with the um, it's quite traditional glaze called tin glaze, it's white. Uh, but over the glaze, uh, over the tin glaze, uh, with very white brush, I put uh, metal oxides. Blue for co cobalt blue, uh, fire becomes blue, obviously, cobalt, and the green is a copper when it's fired. It fuses into the, into the glaze and it stays there forever, literally forever. Particularly outside, not many materials can actually withstand weather and being exposed to sunshine, sunlight, and stay like that. Um, so the little bowl that keeps the uh, you know trace of my hand uh, and been fired and stays for a long time was really something that I was very fascinated about. Um, being an architect, I always thought, you know, what can I do with this? And, you know, um, particularly with the colours. I love colour, and um, the image behind me. Uh, it's all about colour, but it's also about clay and it's about ceramics. Um, as Jenny mentioned, I've uh, won a Winston Churchill Fellowship, which is Travelling Fellowship, which allowed me to travel abroad. So I went around Europe and to US, and I went to this small uh, town in Hungary called Piech. It's in the south, uh, south of Hungary. It's a very special place because this is a place where uh, the location of a factory that made at the beginning of the uh, 20th century made a ceramics which were uh, frost resistant um, and also very colorful. Mm -hmm. So this little uh, factory, I mean it's not very little, it used to be very big and used to be very successful and uh, produced ceramics for most of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So many buildings in Vienna, particularly roofs of cathedrals and many ceramic buildings have been made in this factory. So what is very special about this image for me, um, it's a color obviously, and it's not just vibrancy of the colors, it's very, ceramicists would know that it's very difficult to produce um, particularly reds and yellows um, with a high, um, with a high fire ceramics. But they managed it, they had these secret uh, recipes which they kept uh, within the family, it was family run business. But what this also has is this amazing jewel-like quality. Some of, the play, some of the tiles are iridescent. That was another secret kept by the factory. So, for me, um, colored ceramics and buildings are like a jewelry. They actually decorate buildings. They bring individuality, like jewelry would bring to a person, um, and they definitely create a sense of place, um, which is really something that, as an architect, I aspire very much to, to, to create in my practice. Um, so, so much I've been inspired. I came to England, did more research, um, you know, how this can be done, because it used to be done all around Europe, all around the world. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, without the war with, you know, modernista in Spain. Um, hasn't been done throughout the 20th century with modernism, which created white boxes and was, mm -hmm. color was totally excluded. Um, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful, why not? So this brought me to, um, my research brought me into factories. And here is my second object, which I wanted to show you. It's a brick. <laughs> it's been made in a brick factory. Um, and it is very much um, similar to this object. It's the same terracotta clay. Um, it's been made with the help of our brick makers in a factory with my design. So it's not just a simple brick, even though it's humble brick. Um, but it's been modeled with sort of digital molds and also. But uh, it's been decorated by hand using exactly the same materials as this little bowl. It has tin glaze, you can see it's a little licked. And on top it has a cobalt oxide. What is 
really important to me about this object is that it can go into a building. Mm -hmm. It's been made in a, in a factory, it's been tested, it's been through the same process, even though it's green shape and different color, it can actually be built, can be put into a building, understand weather, and actually be st structurally load bearing. So this is the progress of my practice, but um, I just wanted to show you more examples of everywhere around the world, of examples how ceramics can tell stories, can keep, keep narratives and create very site-specific uh, places. And it's not just about the building, but it's about the street. It's about atmosphere that it creates around it. This particular building is in Portugal, um, 18th century, and it's probably similar to today's graffiti. Um, it's a story. It's a story of a Bible because the building is a church. Um, it's uh, Azuelas. I hope I pronounced it right. Azuelas. <laughs> Azuelas. Yes, I couldn't try. <laughs> um, but it's 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 the same. Essentially, it's the same material. It's it's a clay that's been fired and it's been decorated with the uh, with the cobalt oxide, exactly the same way that, as this little ball was. Um, 200 years later, it's still there, um, and you know, it's longevity, but also the atmosphere and, and individuality that ceramics create in the buildings. Um, all around the world, I've mentioned, you know, uh, cultural references and Islamic architecture is one of the amazing examples how um, ceramics been used for creating patterns, motifs, um, inscriptions can be built into a building, you know, you can see all around the portal, uh, you know, text can be put into a building telling a story. Um, so the, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, sometimes it's quite humorous, as this, this little guy uh, in The Hague. Um, I mean, all of these pictures have been taken uh, on, on my travel in, in researching uh, ceramics in public spaces, particularly in public spaces, because I really would want, you, you know, I aspire my work to bring uh, you know, fun as well in, into the buildings. Um, and this image is uh, work that is downstairs. Uh, you can probably go and see, see the bricks that I've made um, as a part of a project which was done for um, London Festival of Architecture in 2018. Um, th those are bricks that have been uh, made for a bench. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting project. For me, it was fascinating because it was a very um, short period of time that I've been given. It was a tiny budget that I was given. Uh, but the location, City of London, obviously, it's an amazing place. Anybody would be honored to put anything in the City of London. Um, but the task was, the brief of the project was, um, you know, to create something that changes the atmosphere of this gray corporate uh, made out of steel and concrete uh, area, which is City of London. So, you know, I went and did research, <laughs> that specific research, and there are wonderful churches with stained glass windows that are colorful, colorful, crazy colorful. Um, there are, there is so much history. There are, you know, crenellation of medieval walls and um, guilds, city guilds, which have their heraldry. So all of these things contributed to the design of the bench, um, which was there for not for very long time, so I had to recycle the, 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 the uh, bricks. I'm very pleased I could exhibit them here at the Malibu exhibition this year. Um, but this was, this was created using materiality of ceramics, color of ceramics, um, trying to bring, you know, uh, tie, tie, tie to the context, but more, of the, you know, mostly uh, bring a bit of fun to the city. So that was me. Um, I think I'm under time for all yeah. this. <laughs> you have a whole extra minute. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, last but not least, so we have our last speaker for the evening, Lucy Davies. Um, so, I want to again read out the bio and experience to cringe to Lucy, as we all do. So, Lucy, <laughs> can I call your dad, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Lucy is a multi-award winning designer, artist and creative. After graduating from jewellery design at Central St. Martin in 2016, Lucy worked as a designer in residency for Tiffany & Co. in New York. Lucy then worked as creative in advertising for Olympia UK and is now a freelance creative stroke consultant whilst also establishing themselves as an artist. In 2016, their Oyster card now with an RFID chip design um, went viral and attracted attention from press all over the world. 
Um, Lucy's work challenges conventions and aims to bring magic into our everyday lives. Their pieces create entertaining collisions between known art and travelling by the tube, washing up in instant rings or point of self stickers for fine enamel brooches. Lucy's work is um, light-hearted and aims to bring graphic punchy pieces to reconsider value in the materiality and use and offering the wearer an active role in interaction and interpretation. So Lucy, without further ado, Thank hello you. to you. This is me at my <laughs> 2016 graduate show. It's been a while. Um, I chose this image because, as you can tell from my bio, um, a lot of things that inspire me are everyday objects. Um, and at the London Design Museum, there's a wall of 500 everyday objects, but they are put on a pedestal, and they're things that obviously are iconic and each of us recognise, but, you know, we kind of are a bit blindsided by them, we use them so much that we kind of have lost value in them, they don't really mean much to us anymore, um, and there's one object that really spoke to me during my time at Central St Martins, I don't know why but i think it's because i spent most of my time commuting back and forth from uni and there was a lot of thinking time on the tube and the commute so this is my object my oyster card um which i'm surprised that i found because i don't actually use it that much anymore um but yeah so this is my modern day artifact and i also recently read that it might become extinct soon because we're all using, you know, our cards, um, our Apple watches, and things like that. So this is somewhat of a relic and my artifact. Um, and yeah, I guess a lot of my practice revolves around um, trying to re-establish our attachment to these objects. They're always on us, um, and obviously I study jewellery design, and jewellery is something we wear, it's something that's valuable and precious, and I was questioning why we didn't kind of look at these everyday objects in the same way we did as these precious items, because we are always with them, they're like our constant companions. Um, so I wanted to rethink how we could um, have them attached to our bodies in different ways, why are they always in our purse um, or in our jacket, people are always losing them as well. Um, so how can we re-establish that relationship in an exciting and fun way because the tube is also somewhat of a miserable place. <laughs> um, so um, I tend to just look at my surroundings as much as I like to start every project by going to an exhibition or things like that. I just tend to look at words and things around me that we pass every day and that we don't really notice because we're always in a hurry. So, yeah, that's the reason for that. Um, and I kept hearing these things as well, saying don't forget to touch in and out. And um, a lot of my work revolves around wordplay too. Um, and I was thinking, why, wait a second, why don't we just do that? Why don't we just touch in and out? Um, and so, yeah, I guess that I was looking at these everyday objects and trying to take a step back and rethink what could this be, how could we make this more fun, um, and yeah, there's my little jewellery line there, um, imagining my new commute um, to my jewellery degree studies. Um, and um, yeah, I guess sketching is where I also like to start off and also by taking apart these um, everyday objects because who knew there would be such a long coil in such a small thing here um, and I had to go through about like 10 of those. I was really grateful to some of the students on the course too because I was begging them for their oyster cards. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess there's an element of surprise during the process of making um, and not knowing what you're going to find and also the outcome of my piece. I always like to bring a smile to people's faces and um, yeah, that element of surprise and magic to a routine that can be so mindless in a way. Um, 
So yeah, after several attempts, I decided to put the RFID chip in some nails, um, acrylic nails, so that you could literally touch them and out on the tube. And there we have it. Um, and I got my friends Erin um, and Rachel to model them, and we did get a few laughs and smiles from um, <laughs> TFL, which I did ask their permission. I was like, look, I'm doing this really weird project. Can you just let me film this? Um, and they said, yeah, sure, we'll go for it. <laughs> really fulfilling to see something change from this into something else and um, yeah that element of surprise um, and yeah I guess just questioning what can become of these everyday objects that we don't really take much notice of but we are literally attached to them in so many ways um, and yeah, there were just two things that I wanted to say to end on this, which is um, inspiration can really come from absolutely anywhere, from the contents of your pocket to signs that you walk past all the time, um, conversations as well. It doesn't have to just come from an exhibition, um, but it did start there for me. Um, and yeah, I was really grateful to win the Your Nova Award in 2016 and um, a dream come true after was um, getting my nails in the London Design Museum. <laughs> um, and yeah, just finishing up by saying that the world is your oyster, so do whatever you want and magic will happen. <laughs>
and then sort of work political uh, sort of way of seeing things. It's 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 one maybe unfortunately. Uh, you know, I I grew up watching the news every single night. I remember all of my friends would be talking about uh, Brazilian soap operas uh, because they're so popular in Angola uh, at school. And I never knew any stories about soap operas because <laughs> my parents were adamant that we had to watch the news. Mm -hmm. And I remember being really young and, and asking my parents, you know, I have this, is there any chance that this school, that they are, you know, this school that is being, I don't know how to say, inaugurated, is being like this new school that's being opened, is there any chance that this is the same school as last week in a different city? And my parents started laughing and they were like, oh wow, you're, you're like six or seven or eight and you know, you, and, and they never said, no, this is not. They were like, you know, you, you're seeing it. And I was so happy that it was the same school. It was like, it's not just the, the color is different, but the landscape, everything is the same. And so I never had the chance to not be engulfed in that space where I'm observing and I'm accumulating, and I'm questioning, and I'm, you know, uh, sort of responding. Um, so, so I think that, yeah, that, that there isn't really that border, you know, I'll, I'll kind of, it's quite difficult to engage with me without speaking about something that uh, maybe isn't, um, I don't know, just isn't entertaining as well, <laughs> because it is the space where, that I'm, I'm familiar with, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's body that's kind of lived kind of in your kind of everyday kind of subconsciousness, consciousness. Like, and I can, yeah, really see how that kind of um, represents itself in the work, especially the work downstairs as well, which was like really quite provocative and understanding the context behind it when you gave a really brilliant really presentation was like, woo! <laughs> like, yeah, some of the references feel a bit obscure, but actually, when you put them into context, it's quite powerful. So, really, thank you for sharing that response. I'm going to move on to Maria. And um, again, also thank you for sharing the references yeah. and the plethora of the visual references that inform you. I didn't realise you made those bricks. I thought there were found bricks that you then kind of like repurposed and um, kind of re-articulated. So that's even like, oh, throw my question up in a slightly different way. So I'm going to reframe it in a, in a slightly <laughs> different way. So I'm sorry. That's all right. But um, so now that, and then that you reappropriate objects, how does that inspire you to make them a part of the public space, a part of our everyday life, for this kind of inspiration and creativity that you're speaking about in your, in your presentation? Sure, sure. Well, I should probably go back and explain mm -hmm. that, no, they're, they're actually reappropriated. Ah, okay. As well, <laughs> they're both. Mm -hmm. um, the, the core of my work, why I started making this work, as I said, um, my desire of making cities into, um, into a special places, uh, where actually, came from the fact that there are so many places that are monochrome, are very grey, um, uninteresting, and made out of uh, material that can actually, has so much potential. So by using materiality of ceramics, uh, I'm trying to reintroduce this potential of bricks in my work, and particularly in the work that I've shown. Um, so yes, there are bricks that are made in a factory, that are standard bricks. What I've done to them, I've actually remade them into something special. So uh, some of the bricks that I made are actually made in a custom mold, so they are start from scratch if you want. Um, so I make a mold and I put a clay that is, you know, it's the same clay into a special mold. But it's still the same shape of brick, the same size. And that is actually the beauty um, of, of the fact that those are modular objects that can be put into a standard sort of, um, you know, standard construction, but can represent something very special. Um, so reappropriating, as, you, as you're putting it, uh, a mundane object, which is a brick, um, in, in, in order to create something special is um, probably the legacy of my work. Um, and the reason for that is why not? <laughs> it's possible. And being a ceramic artist, I know what is possible with clay, with, 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 uh, with the ceramics. Um, and, you know, many ceramic artists actually, and architects, don't connect to. And that's why I think it's so much fun being both because I can see what can be done with the material and the small objects, and why not to put it on a big scale? And yes, we reappropriate bricks that are you know, usually brown or yellow <laughs> um, into something that is colorful, into something that has different textures of flowers in them. Um, so yes, this is, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. Honestly, I really appreciate you just kind of referencing that in-between space, liminal space of being yeah, a ceramic yeah. designer and architect. Yeah, and yeah. Just how that means you see things differently, or yeah, you approach yeah. things differently, or you have a 
kind of different relationship to materiality and it really kind of came through in the work downstairs what you presented yeah, I, I think it's, it's actually mm -hmm. quite you know very lucky I find myself very privileged mm -hmm. being able to make these things because only through making you actually understand mm -hmm. what is possible mm -hmm. um, being an architect I've been in a way a bit frustrated that okay you draw something unless you make it um, particularly you specify materials you know we all specify you know wood clay and concrete or whatever uh, but unless you make um, it, it's sort of a different relationship mm -hmm. with material it's actually quite Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. So that was really, really lovely, really warm answers. Lucy. Hello. So, I remember when your work, as someone who gets in Elspa, and then, as someone who also lives in for Oyster Park, there's something quite practical about, about your project and the nails that you did. And I remember when it went, I saw it on Facebook, so that shows you how it was. Uh -huh. Really went viral, and it just got me thinking about how do you protect your work, how do you protect mm -hmm. your ideas from being co-opted from you know bigger corporates or yeah. you know big boy businesses out there. Um, it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, after it went into like the Evening Standard and stuff like that, a lot of people reached out, which was so exciting. But at the same time, I was. 21, 22, I, I had no idea what the world after uni or what to do when these things happen, um, like banks and independent artists and product developers and things like that reached out, which I was so excited by and so like, wow, this might be a thing. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of people who are doing their own interests and it's hard to protect yourself and your ideas. Luckily, there are some people that I spoke to um, and I could get advice from and they are registered at the intellectual property but there, you know, there's a limit on that and I think I've also had to accept with ideas that I've put out into the world that, you know, in our society, once you put it out in there, you know, especially with social media and the internet, things get spread everywhere and shared and credit gets lost and things like that. Um, so there's an element as well of like, it's, it's hard because they're your babies as well, um, like it, you've put a lot of work into that and for other people to like latch on to ideas that you have and take them despite you being involved or not being involved, there's an element where you have to let go sadly. Um, there's only so much you can do and some people will really be genuine and want you so involved and some others who are a bit more heartless, they don't care. Um, so it's a tough balance and you can only protect yourself, I guess, oh so much. Um, as a creative, I know that a lot of big corporate companies, they still, you know, come to these shows and things like that and, and take mm -hmm. copy ideas, um, which always breaks my heart, <laughs> um, but it's just the way of life, unfortunately. So you can only do what you can. Um, yeah, no right answers. No, mm -hmm. but you kind of, it made me realise, like you said, you're 21, you're super yeah, young, you you're just doing anything. a project. So you also wasn't being asked if you had to also be like a lawyer and learn all these mm -hmm. kind of like, how did that, money like, yeah. To mm -hmm. all of this stuff mm -hmm. on your own. Um, so that's, it's, as I said, you can only do so much and mm -hmm. I guess, speaking to people as well and you know having to support the university and asking them questions and things like that so yeah <laughs> thank you thank you yeah. all for kind of answering my questions for my interrogation so like i said i'm not going to be the chair that holds mm -hmm. so is there any questions or any points or just sharings that people would like to offer up the office today otherwise i can keep going up from questions i don't mind but i'd like to share space with people Thank you. And can you say your name if you don't mind? I'm Maradi. My name is Maradi. Thank you for sharing your experience to us today. And I have a question for Maria. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because I, I really, I really impress, uh, feel impressed by your design for the city, for the buildings. But my question is, how can you find the connections between your, yourself and uh, your creation and the audience? Like the citizens, because you, when you create something, definitely you love it. But how you make sure the audience, the people, they will love it as well? The answer is yes, you can't. You can't be sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but definitely, you're, you're, I, I, for, for, as for me, I love it. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very, <laughs> very grateful. Um, the answer, it, it is, it's actually a very difficult answer. And for designer, I mean, I think, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, as a designer, as an architect, we're trained to produce something for people. Well, obviously, we have duty of care, producing something that works in the public realm. There are lots of codes and things, how things should be done, how right way of doing it. But the way things look, you can't prescribe, obviously. Um, you obviously can think, you know, what works, what doesn't. And that's why I went to do research. My travels was to see what works, what's been done before, what is successful in city spaces, uh, quite apart from having your own uh, personal language, which nobody will take from you, nobody can t tell you, you know, how to do things. And that's wonderful being an artist. That's what design is for, isn't it? It's us doing something that we like. And if we do it with a conviction, hopefully others will like it too. <laughs> That's one thing. Uh, but to see and to build up your vocabulary by looking at things that's been done, it's something that I always do. It's like going to the exhibitions. It's like going, you know, a successful designs which actually you like because there are millions of things done out there. You pick something that you like yourself and that makes your own creation for future different. So when I went, I came back from my travel so much richer as an artist, so much richer as a designer. I mean, these roofs, these things, images that I've shown actually impacted my practice, definitely. It wasn't just, you know, inspiration. Yes, that's what inspiration it is, isn't it? That, that what it's for. It actually impacts your practice. But these things that I've seen were in the public space. People actually love them because they've been there for centuries. <laughs> I think if people hate them, they don't stay that long. <laughs> so in a way, it's a, it's a sign. If something been there long and people, like Gaudi's bench, it's my forever inspiration. I go to Spain, to Barcelona, every time I go, it's full of people. It's full of people, it's a shape, it's a colors, it's a ceramics as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you know, I went and actually asked people, why do you like it? And they told me it's because it's a color, because it's that shape. Mm -hmm. I think, hmm, shape and ceramic and color is good. So, uh, you know, I made the bench. It wasn't as straightforward as that, obviously, I'm making it very simplistic, but um, looking at what works is actually a good sign to check whether your design can be good. Yeah. Um, and also putting your own language, I think it's really important because if you do something that you like, there's a chance that others will like it. If you do something that you're not impressed or 100% sure yourself, it usually shows. <laughs> so if you do something that is fun, usually, like your, your project, people love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that's a really great question and thank you for kind of opening up the space. Any other questions from the audience? I've yeah. got one for Sandra, if that's okay. I'm really like, I really admire how, and I don't know how you do it in a way, like um, how you look at, you know, where you grew up with kind of such fresh eyes um, to the space. Like, and I wonder, I get, I'm wondering if, was there a sort of a moment where you were like, you looked at that man's t-shirt with the EU as opposed to accepting it, just, you know, which, I, you know, I think one, when one is surrounded by things all the time, it's, like you said, it's like naturalised. And so was, was there a moment when that happened with one thing and then it, or is it because you moved uh, country that suddenly things became like uh, more alien or like, I don't know, I'm quite interested to know if you, if you could answer that. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think that I think that leaving Luanda, you know, first I was like for a year and a little bit in Lisbon. Um, I was I was doing I was telling um, Maria earlier I was doing a fashion at the School of Architecture, um, and at the time I remember before that the course was called Architecture Fashion Design because the school was funded towards architecture and fashion, and they wanted to have that course. Mm -hmm. But just leaving Luanda to Lisbon and then to London, um, and through my work also, I guess traveling and, and sort of being in different places, you know, I almost gained that distance mm. that is almost needed to miss it, mm. you know, that distance to gain perspective, that distance to, you know, see, I guess, see things um, with a different appreciation. When I'm in Rwanda, you know, it's the city, it's my city, the city I grew up, it's the city I sort of became a person aware of myself, 
and I feel like standard everything and I want to speak to everybody. And people are like, oh, you're not from here. I'm like, of course I'm from, I'm from that road. And you know, people are like, no, you just kind of like, you know, you move a bit different. Mm -hmm. And it's because I, I want to know everything. I want to talk to everybody. I want to look at everything, even things that maybe when I was young were like a core, I don't know, complaining matter, like the dust. You know, mm -hmm. Rwanda is so dusty. Rwanda is dusty because it lacks green spaces. Mm -hmm. Because a city that just kind of grew up crazy, um, you know, not crazy, informally, uh, from the sort of initial colonial settlement. And, and it lacks green spaces, it doesn't have parks, it, you know, you don't have water in the tap, so you can't really water your plants, mm -hmm. grass. So the city is dusty because, first of all, it's built on a savanna and it doesn't have green spaces to settle the dust. You know, crystal clear. Yeah. But the relationship with the dust, the relationship with the unpaved and the paved city, there's a saying in Portuguese, a saying in Angola that is onde o asfalto termina e a terra batida começa, which means where the sort of paved street ends and the red ground starts. Mm -hmm. And people that live in neighborhoods that are unpaved, they say the other way around mm -hmm. because they see it from the other perspective. Yeah. So how do you like, how do you start? You know, these are things that we just complain about them. The streets are paved, we pay the taxes and nothing happens. How do you start reading the city, reading these connections? Mm -hmm. um, and I honestly don't know what was this click now that you asked, that was actually thinking, what was it that made me look at things in this way? I think that little bit of distance and the urgency to understand what, you know, um, maybe not too many people have the privilege to spend time trying to understand yeah, yeah. And, and sort of generate and organize and, and reconnect and build languages for other people to be able to access in the future. So maybe urgency. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Any other questions people would like to ask? Sandra, do you see Maria? More of an observation, mm -hmm. but I'm really, I'm really enjoying the kind of critical observation mm -hmm. of all of, you know, of all of the the projects and the speaking because there's a you know you're all looking at things in 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 a in, in a different but critical way and finding something new and seeing I think the, the beauty of, of, of what you're seeing and, and how you're opening our way of looking at it mm. is Sandra is really is really strong and, and every time I, I hear you speak about the work it, it seems even stronger and more vital and, and important. But I also think the way the way you're also both looking at, at something and questioning it because they're all straightforward things, bricks, mm -hmm. you know, t-shirts, um, mm -hmm. travel cards, but you mm -hmm. found something, you found a conversation that, that, that then that then asks everybody else to look at things in a different way. And I'm really enjoying that thing across. <laughs> and glazed bricks are beautiful, aren't they? In the old building in Holborn actually there was a light well that was white Victorian yes, yes, white yes. bricks mm -hmm. and, and it meant the light came up much better. They were set they were really dirty. No one could get <laughs> but I kind of love that sense of that and, and how many of those there are in this place. It, it, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, I love the champion of the glazed brick. Thank you. We probably have I'm gonna ask a question and maybe just wrap up. Yeah, I'm not time it's, it's ten to eight. Well me. Um <laughs> cool. that sounds good then. So that's, that yeah. sounds good, it sounds okay you being you free. So just to kind of end the evening without maybe stating the obvious in some kind of way, all women, how does mixed arts <laughs> diversity, <Yeah. laughs> how does gender, or does, maybe the question is, does gender inform your practice or how you go about your relationship with materials uh, or your research? And feel free, you would ever like to take, to take pickings. And go, I need don't. to go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This um, in a way, it doesn't. Um, I don't feel I would do anything different if I would be a man. <laughs> I always operated in a male-dominated profession uh, as an architect, uh, particularly, and also uh, making bricks in a factory as well, actually, incidentally. Um, quite often in a building site, I would be the only woman. But I have put my hard hat, I've put my proper boots, and uh, <laughs> I don't think it made a difference, particularly after they get to know me. Um, I think. Um, fashion and business profession, isn't it? Say, I think, <laughs> the way you make your, you know, I'm not doing anything different, I think, um, because I'm a woman, but um, it's, it's, been, it's, it's been actually um, wonderful being part of a profession that is actually, uh, has both men and women and lots of men on, on the side. Even though it's kind of 
um, how do I put it? Making things that are physically heavy. Um, I think Sarah no noticed it today, I noticed it today. Um, yes, it is heavy, moving bricks, but I had lots of help in the factory. <laughs> <laughs> I got lots of chocolate in all the uh, <laughs> meetings. <laughs> but I made cups of tea for them, so I think it works both ways. Um, so yeah, my, my, my answer would be probably, it's not different. <laughs> I mean, in terms of my practice, I kind of, I do it for everyone. Um, my stuff can be worn for all kinds of people. Um, and I actually had one comment, I remember, I was reading some of the feedback I got from the nails and there was this guy who commented on like YouTube or something on the video and he was like, this is so sexist, what about us guys, what can we have? And I was like, I'm not saying you can't wear nails, I like, can wear them. Um, so I thought that was quite an interesting comment there. Um, yeah, I remember that person also put, what about Oyster Card moustaches? I was like, I can't remember that one, especially like post-corona time. <laughs> but so it was quite funny. Uh, feedback, but yeah, um, it's really empowering though to be up on here speaking with all these wonderful women and say thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I, well, I think there's a number of things. First of all, I think that uh, operating from London, from St. John Martins for four years, um, just kind of moving from Angola where I was just me, and then sort of arriving in the UK, realizing, wait, that's that's a lot about me here <laughs> that I, I I need to sort of navigate. Um, which, you know, I just feel like it's quite it's quite it's impossible for me to dissociate, even at this point, age from race, from gender, from nationality, from you know, um, home not home. <laughs> um, by home, I mean home versus international. You know, all of these things that they sort of, they, they are currencies and they, they work in their own way. I, I, not long ago, I was telling people about this, you know, sort of despair. I was at, I was in Arco Madrid like three months ago showing my work and um, there was a solo boot, so all of the boot was an installation uh, with the chairs made out of fabric. Um, and I was giving tools and explaining the work to people, but it was like a constant thing because we won, but basically the work won an award, the award, the award for the opening section, and uh, there was so many people coming, uh, tours, you know, 40 people, 50 people at a time, and I would explain the work to people, you know, context, pretty much what I did to you guys today, but a whole different project. Context, da da da, Luanda, being there, process, how did I make this? But just like 15 minutes explanation, and at the end there would often be someone in the crowd that would be like, this is incredible, this artist here. And, and you know, that moment is like, wait. And then someone else is like, no, 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 she is the artist. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the person is like, I'm so sorry, it's because you're really young. And I'll be like, yes, it's because of that. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, it's because of that. I'm like 16. Mm -hmm. so, you know. um, and, and, and I think those moments remind me that certain spaces, even this one person, it actually wasn't one person, it happened pretty much every day um, for a whole week. And, 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 you know, those moments remind me that I can't dissociate, I won't dissociate, my body doesn't dissociate, the qualities of my body doesn't dissociate. Uh, and no, I do not create my work, I think a bit like Maria was saying, from a standpoint of gender, but all of that information that I'm carrying is informing everything I'm doing, you know? Uh, it's like saying I would do the same work if I was uh, Nigerian. I wouldn't, my experience would have been different. Lagos is not Rwanda, you know? So um, it's, it's uh, in a way, for me, the, all of those elements, they are incredibly um, sort of heavy in the experience, um, but uh, I do not hold on to them to navigate uh, to none of them. So, you know, just those, those instances, they are like, just kind of a, a little reminder. Um, I wish I had given an answer, but then at the same time I was like, you know, it's quite good that I didn't because I think it was so clear. I think everybody was embarrassed for the person asking the question. And I was like, thank you very much, and I'm leaving, and you know, um, it was an incredible time, incredible for I met 
so many incredible people, and it's crazy that I'm more likely to tell the story of a couple of incidents, mm -hmm. or three or four incidents, than mm -hmm. to tell you guys about the great people mm -hmm. I met, which were much better stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, that I will never forget, but yeah, it's just this, I can't dissociate, I mean, the, the spaces don't dissociate, um, but, uh, but I think it's important for me also to reiterate you know, what's the purpose of being invited to show in exhibitions because they are all women show and I'm like, okay, what's the brief? Mm -hmm. No, it's an all one woman women show, what's the brief? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this is not a good criteria. Mm -hmm. This is not good enough criteria to put me on the show. Um, you know, my work is not about being all women, Angola, no, Angola, no. You know, it's, uh, I really want to know what, what are we trying to access and often I, I want to do uh, things that uh, kind of have gender as the criteria because it's like, again, old women, which women? Who are you? Mm. Who would you, you know? Uh, me, okay, cool, but. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is, this is my, this is how I sort of see it. Thank you very much. No, thank you for really rich answers. Thank you all for just offering and being very generous with your contributions tonight. So Sandra, Maria, and Lucy, I want to say thank you for sharing, talking, engaging, it was really, Ooh, I feel very rich. <laughs> and actually, we're very rich. Just thank you all three. If you could um, engage in a round of applause for our three artists. Um, thank you. Um, I just thank you, Janine, for an amazing sharing situation. Um, and um, yeah, thanks so much for this evening. Um, and thank everyone for coming as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.